Hello and welcome. Well today we're going to be beginning what's effectively a mini series on garden bird photography but what we're going to learn about today the main principle you can apply and you should apply to wildlife photography anywhere in the world any subject. Now I think there are three key elements to any great wildlife photograph. There's the subject of course, there's the light and any great photographer of any genre lives by the light fantastic light makes a photograph, bad light ruins a photograph. But the third element, and the one we're going to be talking about today, is the background. Now, I know people think backgrounds aren't so interesting, aren't so important. I think they're absolutely fundamental to great wildlife photography. So let's begin by finding out what makes a bad background. Well, put simply, a bad background is one that distracts from the main subject. And all these images I'm showing you now, they're horrible. But I want to show you to illustrate what's wrong. They're cluttered, they've got too much in focus, they've got excessively bright patches and all sorts of other distractions like branches cutting through the bird's heads. Anything that takes your eye away from the main subject, the main point of the image, makes it a bad background. OK, well, that's bad backgrounds, but what makes a good background? Well, critically, I think a good background doesn't compete with the main subject. And a really good background lifts the whole image to a completely different level. The best backgrounds tend to be simple, out of focus, perfectly smooth colour washes. They give your images a nice, dreamy look. Simple, simple, simple is the key, and far from fighting for attention, they make your subject pop. So here are a few images to compare and contrast bad backgrounds with good backgrounds. This is obviously a bad background, much too cluttered and complicated. And here's the same bird with a much better background, much cleaner, and it doesn't fight with the bird for attention. Here's a bad background with a stone chat just down the road from where I live. And here's the same stone chat with a nice, clean, undistracting background. Having said that, messy backgrounds can sometimes work. And I think with all rules of photography, this is another one that's, you know, designed to be broken. You just have to understand the rule before you can break it successfully. So, for example, a messy background might be one that just gives a sense of place, but still doesn't detract from the main subject. Um, my favourite messy backgrounds tend to be ones that repeat patterns, like this shot of a great tit I took in my garden a couple of weeks ago. In this case, the complex background actually, I think, adds to the image. Although I must say, what I don't like is that twig right behind the great tit, which spoils it for me. Now, here's a kakapo in New Zealand, and this is a really messy background. But again, I like this one because it does give a sense of place there on the forest floor. So the big question is, how do you achieve a good background? Well, the trick is to make the subject pop, to separate the background from the subject so your eye doesn't get distracted. We'll talk about the different techniques for getting a lovely clean background in a minute, but here are a few clues. This is a blackbird on the woodland floor with a distant background. Here's an Australasian gannet I took in New Zealand in a colony just outside Auckland and I was shooting against a very dark shadow on a cliff behind to make the background completely black. This is a goldfinch in a suburban garden shooting against the sky and in all three cases the end result is a lovely, clean, undistracting background. And here's a wren with a lovely green colour wash behind. Nothing distracting there at all.
Now to achieve a, a, an undistracting and blurry background like the ones you've just seen, you need to take six different things into consideration. We're gonna run through those in a moment. Now, if you're doing garden bird photography, the great advantage is that you can control all six of these relatively easily. First up, we have the distance between you and the bird or whatever it is you're shooting. So generally speaking, the further away the bird, the harder it is to blur the background because you're shooting more towards the infinity end of the lens and therefore the background is more likely to be in focus. Put simply, the trick is to be as close to your subject as you possibly can. Now the distance between the bird and the background is equally important. In fact, if the background is a long way from the bird, it's much easier to blur and turn it into that simple smooth color wash that we're looking for. If it's too close to the bird, it's really difficult to blur it or it's impossible to blur it. So put simply again, the greater the distance between the bird and the background, the better. If the background's too close, then try experimenting. For this American Kestrel, I just got down low and shot against the sky. The focal length of your lens is also very important. It's much easier to achieve a blurry background if you're using a long lens. Now I'm talking 300 millimeter or longer. My go-to lens for most wildlife photography is 600 millimeter, and that helps enormously. I would say it's almost impossible to blur the background if you're using a wide angle lens because the depth of field with wide angle lenses is so great. And even if I'm shooting something like this, this young robin and it's easy to get close, I'll still prefer to use the longer lens to blur the background to make that lovely green colour wash behind. Now the aperture you choose is absolutely critical and it's better to shoot at the widest aperture possible. This ensures a shallow depth of field, a small amount in focus, which in turn helps to blur the background. Now have a look at these images of my pet owl. They, they do speak for themselves, but look at the difference as I run through in the background with each jump in aperture. So this is f32 and watch the background as it changes f16, f8 and finally f4. You can see with f4 the background, the hedge behind has almost disappeared in terms of all the detail is blurry and it's not competing with the pet owl for your attention. The background itself, of course, is also critically important. It doesn't matter what it is as long as it's not distracting. So try to avoid anything that competes with your subject for attention and make sure there are no particularly dark patches or bright patches like this horrible branch over this Chatham Island robin. Just move a little bit. Often it's only a matter of a few feet to the left or the right to get a cleaner background. And think about the colours too. Make the most of blossoms or autumn foliage or anything else that will give your image an extra lift. And finally, the lighting conditions. The amount of light and the strength of the light can have a big impact on backgrounds too. So for example, if it's really sunny and you've got direct sunlight, then it's very difficult to get rid of either very dark shadows or very bright highlights. And here are some extreme examples where the bird's eliminated, but the background is dark, either by shooting at night or shooting against very dark shadow. And the effect can be really quite dramatic. Natural backgrounds, of course, are ideal, but if you can't get a natural background, for example, if you're shooting in a, in a small garden and you can't get a background that's far enough away, or if you want to get something specific, then it's a good idea to try producing an artificial background. And that can work amazingly well. If you do it right, and you blur it properly, it can look really quite natural. So here are some ideas on producing artificial backgrounds. You can get an old bed sheet or a piece of wood or cardboard or an art board as I've got here, and then paint it or spray it in natural looking colors and that replicates foliage. I'm the world's worst painter and decorator, but that's actually an advantage in this case because I can't paint it looking smooth, which would look unnatural. My painting has all sorts of blotches of darker and lighter colours and that works really well, especially when you start to blur it out of focus.
Then you just hang it up between two bamboo poles or you can prop it up on an artist's easel as I've done here and place it wherever you need in the garden behind the bird that you're photographing. Or you can get some camouflage netting, which is surprisingly cheap, as I've done here. I've just hung it over a garden wall. And if you stand back far enough and blur it enough, it looks incredibly natural. It's very difficult to tell whether it's a natural background or an artificial one. Or if you're really lazy and don't fancy doing any of that, you can just shoot against anything with an interesting colour. These are South Georgia shags. Uh, nesting on a whaling station and quite an interesting, quite a colourful background. Here's a robin with nesting material against a blue garage door. And here's the same robin against a white garage door. Simple as that. Just think about the background, have a look and see what's available and make the most of it. Well, that's it for this week. Don't forget to have a look on my website where there's a free downloadable fact sheet on everything we've talked about today on backgrounds for wildlife photography. Next week, I'm going to be talking to Benson Marte, the award-winning Hungarian wildlife photographer who basically reinvented hides or blinds for wildlife photography to take some of the most memorable pictures you will ever see.